think we can start now so guys welcome and you know thank you for joining in thanks for joining in uh, in the evening i know a lot of you might have your classes and thanks a lot to akash for taking out time out of his schedule uh, i've been running behind him and finally uh, you know he is joining us for this webinar so thanks a lot akash uh, quickly to give you a background akash has graduated from tamil nadu national law university uh, from a uh, batch of 2018 and he has also done his uh, llm in international commercial arbitration from stockholm university presently he works as a lecturer and i was just having a chat with him and he teaches arbitration so you know if you ever want to reach out to someone for expertise you know who you uh, have to reach out to so with that akash i think we can start so thanks a lot again for joining in i know you have a busy schedule uh, online classes everything but i am really glad that you know i am hosting you today so i want to ask you akash you have been involved uh, with a lot of uh, moot court competitions since your law school days i mean your blb days so what is that one thing about mooting which you really like i mean i used to like the research part so i want to know it from you what exactly do you like about mooting okay so thank you very much for your invitation to join this webinar on moot and coming back to your question like what's the thing which is excites me about moot so i come from the first batch of tamil nadu national law university so at that point of time the idea for me to moot was because you know that's the only way to actually go beyond your academic curriculum and because we come from the first batch you don't have a lot of seniors to go behind or you have a very good alumni set where, which will help you to you know learn some new things or you don't have a lot of credit courses for that say and getting an internship was also a tough thing so the one thing through which you can actually learn something was moot at that point of time and that is something which uh, intrigued me so that i you know i signed up for a lot of moots and after that the thing which i like about moot is of course that you whenever you go for a moot especially when it's physical so it's not about only the process of learning but it's also like you meet new people you meet you know you make connections you meet some of the faculties who judge you you may meet somebody who practices in that particular field of law and also you meet people who are going to be you know your colleagues after 5 or 7 years when you finish blb or your llm you have those people in your surrounding so you you have a very good chance to make your repo right from there of course you have you know a lot of chances even after law school or even after 10 years of practice or 10 years of work experience that still you make contacts but if you start from that particular point of you know time it's very easy for you to you know go slowly and steadily to that path because it's it's more like it's your raw and original connections which you have because people who come from you know different nlus for that particular moot it's not like they're not going to moot after that or they're not going to work in this particular field of law so that's something through which you know you you get a chance to you know meet new people because especially when you come from you know non nlu or something like you know uh, tamil nadu national law university which is more like a very new law school because we come from the first batch so otherwise you don't get a chance to you know go and meet people from other established and and i'll use or some of the private established law schools so that was something which was in my mind when i started mooting in my first semester itself so akash i would you know uh, thank you for putting that point across that mooting is a very good way to network because yes. you know once you go you are not only meeting or staying with your own teammates but you get to interact with a lot of faculty members as well yes. as you know different mooters so i think this is a very good point and uh, it should be noted by the audience that it's a very good platform and very good opportunity to network so akash coming to the second question i have for you now willem c wis moot you know it's like that moot which people dream to participate in if you see the tier 1 moots uh, if you see a list this will have a place in that list right and mm -hmm. Uh, mooters who frequently moot they wish to participate uh, in this moot at least once because mm -hmm. because of the commitment and everything yeah. but 
they plan to participate at least once now coming back to you in your case you have done it twice okay so uh, what was your reason behind choosing this moot and you know since this is about arbitration your llm is about arbitration you are teaching arbitration was it your interest in arbitration or something else okay just a minor correction i did it actually thrice so once okay. like twice it was from the indian law school that is tamil nadu national law university and the third time i did from stockholm university right. so right. when i when i was actually so the story goes back to 2015 actually so in 2015 right after my you know second uh, year when when the second year finished so my third year was starting and you know in india we have inductions Right. So right. every law school conducts their own induction. So it was the, and we have one induction for the whole one year, and you get a chance to go for two moots, and in a, so whoever gets the rank one, will choose any moot they wish to. They may choose to go for Jessup, or like whatever it is, like Vegas or you know Stetson. Right. So I I sat for the inductions, and that was the first full fledged induction. in tnlu because it was a new law school so every time we used to have you know a mini trial where like let's say it's a moot xyz so everybody you know gives their name and there is a challenger but that was the first time where the you know moot court society decided that we'll have one induction so that it saves our time throughout the year so and there were 204 people participating and i sat for it i got rank 1 in that and my Uh, and my moot partner got ranked too so then we had options to choose which moot should we go for so because i had already been to tankha moot which was partially an arbitration moot even at that point of time now it's fully an arbitration moot and i had been to one jaipur national university moot which was an aviation law ba- based on arbitration so we thought that instead of going to jessup which was like the most sought after moot in india especially during my times like whoever is like gets the rank one has to go because of this you know unwritten obligation that you should go for jessup but jessup was more about you know public international law and i was somebody who liked constitution and all this public international law the code international law but i wasn't really very much into this one so i decided that i should go for arbitration and th- this moot was huge because in hong kong at that time it was i think 120 teams participating and in vienna i guess it was around 320 or something right during that time so we thought that we should go for this one but the problem was that it was happening in hong kong and we didn't have any kind of funding okay. so if we have if we choose that moot it's more like a you know like a, in my law school it was more like you know it's it's like a suicidal step <laughs> because you choose a moot where you don't have a sponsor right so you pay for it and because it's 120 teams coming across the globe so it was a very tough moot and we didn't had anything like you know clover arbitration or we didn't had a coach at that point because it was a very new law school and moot court society was itself you know in in the you know initial days they were trying to establish it so we thought that we'll go for this even in that case because it's arbitration and that's something which we have at least seen like what it is and that was something which was of our interest so the first time it was more like you know you can say that it it was like a choice instead of we shouldn't go for some other moot we thought that let's try for arbitration so that was the first thing but when we went there the first time it was huge for us like because and we 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 never expected anything but we got this spirit of the moot which is more like a new law school which comes and participate and they do you know something so the organizers themselves choose one team out of like every team and they give you know a kind of token of appreciation that so that you should come next year you shouldn't be like you know depressed after the results that you didn't reach the knockouts so the first time this happened and right after that because we didn't have any funding and stuff so i wrote to the government and it was more like a 6 7 months process and i got the funding from the government of tamil nadu so every year we get the funding for this moot specially so there is a budget passed by the chief minister of that time and there is a amount of money which is fixed for the this moot tamil nadu national law university team and then the next year it was more like everyone wanted to go for this moot you know the reasons because it's obvious because you get funding right so again i sat for the inductions and the in the inductions again i got the same rank 1 and 2 so we decided that this time we go to vienna 
because we had already tried hong kong so we thought let's you know improve ourselves and let's do all of our preparation and let's go for vienna but unfortunately we didn't qualify the knockout rounds no. and the issue was again we didn't have the coach we had some resources this time but it didn't work out so that's the reason in 2018 i decided not to go for this move because i thought like from this limited amount of support which was huge like at least the government is giving us some sponsorship but i i thought that it's not worthwhile to again go there unless until i'm 100% prepared so that's the reason why i went twice and the second time it was more my inter- it was more about my interest in arbitration right. so right after that year instead of going to wismuth what i decided is to go for an internship in an arbitration center right. so i went to malaysian arbitration center to pursue my interest in arbitration Good. and when i went there i saw everyone was having very fancy you know arbitration llm degree which actually fascinated me that you know if you want to go into that field you need to get you know an llm in arbitration from a decent law school that actually led me to apply for the llm in arbitration and the third time it was stockholm so it was more like you know we had all the support system you just have to crack the inductions and you get it so that's the reason yeah so now you have told the viewers that you know uh, you won the spirit of the moot award and mm-hmm. i think that was your first time participating in this moot and uh, you know how was your experience so you told us your entire journey one moot three times right i i have never heard anyone participating in one international moot thrice okay so how was your experience going back to the same moot and then you guys received i think the honorable mention for the best memorandum for the claimant side and you guys qualified like as top 16 teams out of 372 teams participating across the globe so i mean how was your experience what what was the difference when you participated as a you know a student of a indian law school went ahead and you know after you took all the experience you again participated in the same moot as an llm candidate so i think i'll put it this way that you know the indian law schools perform extremely well in the international moots because i know for the fact that the law schools which are performing great in states and jessup ways every year india has very good results so the amount of support we get in india is quite different from the amount of support we get in any of the you know especially the top 100 or top 200 universities law school support so the indian teams which perform better are because of the extra amount of efforts i'll put it this way that these students are extremely hard working the indian students when they reach the knockout rounds of this which is top 60 and you know now there is a trend in india that you have a mentor or a coach but i remember that even when i was in 2015 when 2016 i was in hong kong i saw indian teams qualifying without even having a coach which is amazing so the amount of hard work which indian students do is way more than actually any other you know foreign law schools which have a lot of good support system so in stockholm university we had like you know a set of coaches we had one of our student coach we had a faculty coach then we had a faculty advisor so the you know the support system which you have so there is somebody so the i'll put it this way that in india if you have to decide that whether this argument works or what you should do with this so what you do you ask your teammate right and the other teammate you have a consensus either you say yes or no right yeah. but when you go where you have a support system so what you do you have somebody to ask you don't ask them like what's the answer they are not going to tell you the answer any of the coaches even in india will not tell you what's the answer but you can say that i'm thinking of these three ways which one of these three do you think is better one so they will say this one it's not like they are going to tell you which way you should go for like by themselves it's like you have to put across three options and you ask which one is more convincing or you ask for their help in that particular thing but some people in india misunderstand this concept of having a mentor or coach some people think that it's the mentors or the coach's job to write the memorandum some people think that the coach doesn't do anything right. both are actually technically wrong the coach or mentor's job is just to guide you it's not like they're going to decide the team decision like who should be oralist or who should be 
a researcher at the end it's a team decision which is in line with the coach's advice but it's your team it's you have who have to decide so i think the problem is you know in terms of of course there are some law schools which do not have resources but i think after this lockdown quite of quite uh, quite of this problem is resolved because now everyone is putting it like you know the moot resources free of cost on their website i think even cruer arbitration you can access now because of e proxy things now yeah. but way back like 5 years before there was nothing like e proxy working everywhere on all the websites so that's something which which is actually a difference and especially when you come from a very established law school in india then you have some alumni who have done that moot so there exists high likelihood that somebody who was living in your hostel itself will help you with that moot right but if you start thinking about a very new law school where you don't have an alumni and you don't have the trend of coaches like for example now you see like i was looking at some of the linkedin status of anant memo pandit and he was uh, introducing some new three mentors for the you know some moots right. so this is the new thing if we go back to like 2017 or 16 if we say that do you have a mentor or a coach for the team people will be surprised like why do we need a mentor or coach Right. So that's that's more like a trend towards you know the good side of the mooting, and I think it helps. It helps a lot. So Akash, you were in your uh, like you know uh, when you participated in the West Moot for the first time. Uh, which year were you in? So I just entered my third year. So I finished my second year and I entered my third year. Okay. Okay. So more or less like around fifth semester. Yes, it was fifth semester. Right. so uh, how did you actually initiate your uh, you know uh, the entire preparation like you get your moot proposition and it is released i think 6 months prior to the date or one year yes, prior so i'm not so sure it's release every time in the first week of october by right. first of october right. you have the problem right and so how, what was your strategy i mean how did you start preparing for the moot and like sometimes what happens is you are aware of what the background is all about yeah. right now you know for a fact that jashup is related to inter public international law mm-hmm. so in this case were you like well versed with the background and like how so, did you prepare so i i talk about the stockholm university one and not my previous experiences when i was in my fifth semester so of course when i participated for the first time i was unaware that i can prepare at least 20 to 30% before the moot itself Right. but when i was signing up for the inductions in stockholm university so our inductions happen in september itself okay. so this is how it works like before the problem releases you need to like finish all the prerequisites one is of course like your team should be ready you have to form the team but i see in like india a lot of law schools keep their inductions for wes in like september or last week of october after the problem release so you you are actually behind and what if i tell you that the memo submission the first memo submission is in december okay and in china you have a pre moot happening in november okay. okay so even before you submit the first stage memorandum you have a pre moot in china which shows that the law schools which participate in that particular pre moot are so ahead that when you are actually thinking about writing the memo they have a structured or you know the skeleton memo and they are actually having a pre moot the oral rounds so it it shows like how you know early you need to start so the idea is that the problem release in october so before that you need to form the team and there are a lot of things which you can do beforehand so right. one is of course that you know not everyone is like into arbitration Right. So you need to understand the basics of arbitration, for which there are, you know, quite a lot of books on cruer arbitration. So the fa- very famous one, the most mostly cited one, is Gary Bond's Treatise, which is three volume book. Yes. And if you want a shorter ver- version, you have Hunter's book on arbitration. So that's something which you need to, you know, study before the problem releases, so that you understand the arbitration part. But the problem with arbitration part is every year. one of the arbitration centers throughout the globe bids for it and their rule will be applied so you don't know which one is going to be so you always know sorry you know which arbitration centers rule will be applicable because if it's 2021 we know for the fact if you go to the website which rules will be applicable in 2022 so you can start you know reading 
about basics of arbitration and then about that particular rules because the problem will be based on that right. and the substantive issues of the moot will be covering cisg which is convention on international sale of goods which is permanent in all the moots so whatever contract it will be it will be cisg problem so cisg is something which you are required to study beforehand you shouldn't wait for the problem like of course you streamline your research when the problem is released but unless until you know what cisg is what are the authors which we should read you you are like way before you you have a lot of work to do when the problem releases so yeah. for cisg you are required to read the commentary by ingeborg schwenzer so that's that's like the bible for cisg so you have to read that one so that's something which we did in stock but when i was doing it from the indian law school because i wasn't aware of any of these and we went there we didn't know like how do we actually divide the issues right is it like procedural issues or substantive issues we were not aware of this and some of the arbitrators helped us in the first round that you should do it this way not this way so that's the point where a mentor or somebody who has done that moot if you had a practice round you get to know right. right and at that point of time i wasn't using linkedin which was my fault i should have actually approached people which which i think i i started using linkedin effectively by like fourth year of law school but still even in india like right now a lot of people are skeptical about it that we shouldn't use linkedin we shouldn't ask people out like could you please have a practice round the maximum the other person can say is i'm really sorry i'm busy that's it right but if you don't try it like no use so please feel free to like test your arguments that you know some people who are in that field who have done that move and now like i see a lot of people you know approaching now and now right. the trend is changing right so that's something which which is you which is something you can do way before you know the problem releases what is of course team formation you can decide like how how are we going to do it like the time table like which date like i'm not saying that the team should work together which means like in one room they have to work for 7 days i'm not saying that but the idea is that you should fix one or two meetings per week in which the team sits together either digitally or physically and they decide what's the update right. what they have done and they cross check each other it's their job to do it but if you just divide the work and if you are not checking up on your teammates there may be a chance especially in this this happens that you know when you are reaching the deadline one of your friends says i didn't do anything right so you start writing it so the problem is if one of your issue is not up to mark you lose out and you are not going to you know get marks for that particular memo right. because it loses out from the arbitrator's mind so yeah so akash now you've told us you know like a checklist of what we have to do before the moot even uh, before you receive the proposition and then how you have to go about it what are the uh, reading materials now one question is let's say for indian law students okay uh, we have our classes going on subsequently we also sometimes uh, you know are in between our mid terms or end terms project submission so and you have to stand for your viva if you have physical exactly, classes exactly exactly so uh, you know uh, how much time did you spend uh, you know in preparing for it and just to uh, ask you this question since you have already gone through the process approximately how much time a student should put in you know to prepare for a moot like this i think it's it's more like you know a very it, this moot requires a lot of commitment right. so i always say either you like give your 100% or don't do it because the problem is the moot problem releases in october but the inductions normally happen in september the moot finishes in april so it's more like 8 months process okay so this 8 months if even if you lose like one month out of this duration you are not going to go to the knockouts that's 100% sure you do one mistake in your you know 30 minutes round in vienna or hong kong you are out that's the golden rule you just do one mistake and a mistake i don't know what the students think what a mistake can be but the most famous mistakes i have seen after judging a lot of indian moots and judging indian teams in international moot as well is that when the arbitrators ask you that you are over time please wrap up 
you don't wrap up you start arguing if you just do this even if you are very good somebody who is going to give you higher 90s will never give you higher 90s and in one round you don't get decent 80s which is 85 plus you are out even though your memo was amazing your oral skills was good but just because you cut off one arbitrator when he was speaking you are out so this 8 months is like you have to commit either you commit or you don't do this mood because otherwise i i know some of the students told me this that sir it's always better to do you know a national mood which is more like a 2 to 3 months thing and you have a very good chance i totally agree with that it's it's your decision you have to choose whether do you want to utilize this or not because this is not just the mood because you make friends throughout the globe you meet a lot of people you can do, go for an internship you can get a traineeship for that you can get you know uh arbitration llm after that because a lot of people write that you know this was the frigging part in their you know academic career so right. this is not just the mood so either you do it or you don't do it because the problem is if you are not doing it even like if if you are not qualifying the knockouts which a lot of good teams are also not able to do it okay so then you lose out on your 8 months time so i'm not saying that every time you need to qualify knockout but you need to learn in that process you need to make good connections you need to get something out of that mood it doesn't mean that you have to get through the knockout but some people like when you go especially in vienna so especially the indian teams they they are hesitant to talk to foreigners they are hesitant to you know go to a team and say hi and that's that's something which you have to do otherwise there is no guarantee that you are going to go to the top 60 then what do you what do you come back with you don't make friends you don't make connections you don't meet new people you don't actually have any connection with foreign universities so what have you done have you just gone there tried to do great in moot which you couldn't so at least you should get something out of it right so the idea is that it's a process and you are required to actually you know utilize this moot because it's a long process you have pre moots for that you need to practice for it you know you go to somewhere or you in now it's digital so you can you know talk to some other countries you know the students from different countries and you can try out you know talking to their arbitrators you never know like when you will be able to you know work with them or when you'll be getting any help from them or maybe you can get a chance to work with them in the near future but it's more like you 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 need to approach them and there is nothing to be hesitant about it right right yeah. so akash uh, let talking about all the you know process right so now you have your mood proposition then comes that you start working on uh, decoding it and then you sit with your team start working on it now this is a mood which again as you mentioned that it's a long commitment right Eight months is like a long commitment for a law student who also has the university things to take care of, right? So how, uh, like, and often for these sort of moods, the major issue is that the research is also intense, right? Yes. You have to read a lot. You have to uh, refer to a lot of sources. So I want to know from you that how did you guys carry out the research? You were a part of a team. How did you carry the research and are there any specific resources which you uh, you know uh, refer to while preparing your memorial i i think that's the most boring part of the this mood yes because unless until you reach the pre mood stage everything is so boring especially when you are in stockholm it's more like during the winters you don't see sun for 6 months yeah. so it's it's so boring that what you have to do is just to sit on your laptop and do research and write the memorandum so it's a very tough job because when you go for the pre mood or digitally or physically it's it's amazing like you go and you try to argue you you know test your arguments you meet new arbitrators so at least you see some, somebody right but when you are doing the research it's just five or six or three or four members of your team sitting together and researching so that's that's the tough job but the idea is how you do it so some teams there are different strategies i'll tell you what we did in stockholm so let's say there are five people so you divide the issues and you divide the work Right. unless until you divide there is no accountability whichever law school you are in and you know the team disputes are very famous in india 
I'm seeing the team disputes from my mood code society till even now. Like I see people like who have problems within the team. You know, somebody says that this guy doesn't work or this girl doesn't work, and they they have an internal fight, and they lose out on the mood. It's hundred percent sure if you start fighting within the team. So the problem is to avoid these kind of disputes. You need to have a proper division of work, which is more like in the first part that is the claimant memos let's say there are four people you divide the four issues okay and it's not like if the fourth issue is allocated to mr a he has to do it and nobody is going to check up on him or her so it's more like every week when you have the team meetings you discuss what happened and it's not like you have to submit the final draft by let's say 5 days before the deadline it's more like first draft second draft third draft so every week you send one draft so usually what happens that i send one draft at that particular day and after two days there is a team meeting and the coaches give you the feedback on that first draft then we have a team meeting in which the coaches and the other team members will debrief like whether this argument makes sense this argument doesn't fit this is wrong or this is amazing so we discuss it together and then we go to the second draft and second draft is more like a revision to the first draft so what happens instead of sending the first draft itself which is the problem with some of the teams that they just made a draft and they submitted it right. the pr- idea is that you have a first draft you revise it second draft so once you have seven eight drafts so by the time the deadline is near you have so what what happens after that there is nothing like you have several drafts you just club it right. then comes the job of a lead writer so let's say if the team comprise of five people so one of the person will be designated as a lead writer their job is after you have like one month left at least when there is 30 days left or more days left you appoint the lead writer and lead writer's job is they submit their own part and they compile all the parts in one document and checks upon everything like footnotes the page limit whether everything is properly drafted and then comes the most important part which is the tone of the paper the idea is that let's say if i have a habit of writing in active voice which makes which is more convincing but let's say somebody in my team is also a very good team member but he or she has an habit of writing in passive voice so if you submit this draft if i'm going to check it from the wis mood i'll get an image that this lead writer hasn't done the job properly because you have to change the tone it should be in one tone it shouldn't be like after seeing it i shouldn't get i shouldn't get like first issue is written by somebody else second issue is written by somebody else so that there comes the job of the lead writer to make it so coherent that if you send it to any of the arbitrators or any of the seniors or you know the coaches they'll not understand who has written what because in one issue you see a lot of complex words right. you know and the other part it's more like very simplistic english so then you get to know like this there's no coherence so those are the things which is important to you know go for the excellence even if you don't do it you'll do fine the maximum you do is like your orals will be there to you know help you to go to the knockouts but if you want a prize in this one or if you want to make it so good then this also is one of the criteria so the lead writer's job come into picture and every time you have the draft you update it through the coach's comment and by the time you reach the final stage you have like five or seven of the complete draft or at least two three and then the final one you just put it on the share screen and you read word by word so that there is no spelling mistake there is no grammar mistake because sometimes instead of writing the claimant should not you write claimant should and if that's the thing which you know if an arbitrator reads they are going to not give you 90s even though you are amazing just one spelling mistake in the first part of the memo so you you read word by word before submission and then you are good to go so we did it this way but i'm not saying this is the only way but the idea is like you need to have an accountability and you need to keep keep on checking because sometimes let's say one of your team member says that i'm not well i'll do it in the next week and then he keeps on you know doing this kind of thing and at the last point of time you get to know like you have to write it right. so if you have the team meetings where you have the briefing and debriefing you know like somebody is not working so what you do instead of fighting you take the responsibility either you divide that issue or somebody has to take a call that i will do this part but you know how how it works in india that stop start blaming each other and then just fight 
एंड मूड को बाद में देखा जाएगा सो दिस इज हाउ इट वर्क बट इफ यू डू इट दिस वे दईडिया इज दैट यू हैव अकाउंटेबिलिटी एवरी Right. So Akash, you've talked about uh, you know mentor and that you did not have a mentor when uh, you were preparing while you were in uh, you know TNL. So I just want to know like uh, what is the importance of a mentor? Now you've already told us that okay, me- mentor is not going to sit and you know write memorial on your behalf because obviously yeah. the mentor is not participating in the mood you are right. Yes. So, even if he writes and you don't know anything you are anyways out of the knockout and nobody so, writes it i'm 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 saying it because i have a lot of friends who are you know evaluating the memorandums and judging this nobody does it it's it's just the mindset that some people think that you know the coaches will sit down and tell everything they'll dictate and the students will be writing right it doesn't happen it doesn't have nobody has time right so uh, you got a chance to be mentored by some uh, i i believe some people in back in stockholm university so how important was it i mean did you see a difference in your preparation while you were here uh, you know participating in this uh, in uh, from uh, tnnlu and in stockholm okay so the short answer is a lot of differences i'll just give you one example and i think it will be more relatable to everyone so i still remember like my coaches before going to the first pre mood like after you like yesterday was the date on which you have to second the sub- second memo and now it's just the orals which is left so after we did that so we were told that we are going to romania which is one of the european countries and the capital is bucharest so we have a bucharest pre mood so the first thing our coaches told us that we are going for this pre mood and the golden rule is this that whenever you go for the pre mood and you go to any public place unless until you are in your own hotel room you never talk about the round you never talk about how akash was speaking how maxim was speaking or how the opponent team was speaking and how how are the other teams are or how the how that lady was or how that guy is that's the first rule and that's the golden rule and every time they were saying this and we saw that and there is a reason why they told us this because a lot of teams what they do right after the rounds they start talking and the arbitrators get a very bad image of you and the team and the university and you are not representing yourself you are representing one of the university and a lot of teams have this habit of doing this so once you start doing this do you think that arbitrators do not talk in between themselves we do talk we do talk about which law school is good which law school is bad who was talking about what so that's something which comes from somebody who had a very good experience right so if you talk about an indian team going without mentor i'm i'm pretty much sure that unless until you see some kind of webinar like this or some some somebody teaching this mood how you do it you'll never come across because you don't have somebody to tell you this and that's something which you don't come through by your own right that how how do we do this because that's not technically a part of the moot right so and and i'll give you another example the other example is very relatable that you know once the moot is over especially in india this happens whenever i judge this you know indian moots so i give feedbacks so some some organizers like it that you give feedback some organizers hate me Nee that you give feedback I didn't hear uh just wait a second 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 when you give feedback some people start defending it they cut you off like the judges and they say no no i wasn't saying this i was saying this and they start arguing so that's something so wrong which is like you the the coaches told us this that the only thing you are allowed to say in the feedback is just smile and say thank you it doesn't matter whether you agree with the feedback you do not agree with the feedback because in some moods what happen after the feedback they give you the marks 
because it's the discretion of the judges some judges directly mark you some judges you know just write on their notepad and they give you the final mark so if you start arguing even if you are amazing speaker you have a very good oratory skills but still you fail because you started arguing so that's something which shows the role of the coach or mentor that before the pre moots or before the oral rounds they tell you that don't do this and they do this from your practice session itself in the practice session they teach you this but you know some people do not get this at once so they keep on telling you so that you know that don't do this right. but if you do not have them i don't know like how you get it because if you go to youtube you see the finals video and you see the you know skills but nobody is coming in the finals and telling you you shouldn't do this right so that's the place where you know it's not technically a part of this but this works everywhere everywhere and some judges who get frustrated when you cut them off they give you 60s and they say i i wish that you do not qualify so i give you 60s can you do anything about that no because it's my discretion right if i think this team deserves 60 can anyone question me not really even if the other person gives you 90 it doesn't mean that somebody sitting next to them should give and just to give you one tip as well that some of the you know teams think that you know if somebody is actually relating to their argument so they make an eye contact with that particular individual on the bench so please understand that you know especially in moots like this when you go so you have two or three people judging you right so all of them have equivalent number of marks the 100 marks right so please do not over focus on one of the judge and you know ignore the other judge because at the end if you do not you know consider the other two members active or if you don't look at them or if you start ignoring them they may say you in the feedback that i was thinking that we were not sitting here mm. and this happened this happened in one of the pre moot somebody told this and it was very awkward so of course you are not going to get 90s for that so these are small things which come through experience either you have done it once you have seen this or somebody who has experience tell you this so these are you know some of the things which are you know helpful when you have a mentor and it's more like i always say that not having a mentor doesn't mean that you cannot go to the knockouts because that's something proved a lot of times by the indian law schools but the idea is that it makes the job easier right. it's more like you know the non nlu versus nlu debate on linkedin you know every time i see this debate i haven't participated in it but it's it's simple like nlu has a better platform it's like a train law school law career is a train right so the train is parked somewhere and to reach that platform for an nlu student it's a bit easy for non nlu student it's a bit tough but it doesn't mean that the train is not there it's on the same platform but your way is a bit tough it doesn't mean that the train will leave all the non nlus the train is still there so that's the only thing the way is a bit smoother helpful for nlu and for non nlu it's a bit not so smooth that's it but still the train is there right so akash you you made a very good point that having a mentor you know just makes the job easy because some some mentor can actually say hey i have been there and i have done that right and they can actually tell you what not to do rather exactly. than telling you what should what to do. do yeah right so i think that's a very good point i mean uh, you know i and a point to be noted by the audience and uh, that's why i think we have built up on this particular thing and we you were talking about our mood mentorship program we have been coaching a lot of teams and you know one one good feedback which we receive is now we have a proper pathway to follow exactly that's uh, we were roaming here and there like headless chickens but now we know this is our goal the goal is the yeah. moot and we know how to which route to follow you know so the mentor acts like a gps it, it will tell you what exactly to... that that's that's more a simple way to put it and it's a very right. good way exactly it's more like a gps right. it tells you where to go so you know thanks for putting that out and i loved your example where your men- mentor actually told you guys to not talk about if anything in the public i think that's extremely important for Because not the- because the problem is that in ways in vienna you have 10000 people coming across the globe even right. if you are sitting in one of the starbucks you don't know who is sitting next to you man it's right. vienna and it's the westmoot 
Right. So in India, maybe if you if you are in Pune, if you go to Imagica, you start talking about the tea because the national mood is not like ten thousand people are coming in. Right. But in Vienna, you talk and it spreads like fire. Right. It spreads like fire. Right. So it doesn't matter if you go to the knockouts, but you have to keep the you know image of your university. That's the most important part. Right, right. So Akash, um, I want to ask you this. Uh, so you had a team, like a proper team. You know, sometimes we meet with people who we don't know, right? Let's yes. say we pair up and we participate in. And this. we start fighting. Yeah, and. to strike that understanding you know people mm-hmm. take time to get acquainted to their teammates and mm-hmm. also you know share a level of understanding, understanding that okay i am not doing something then you do it okay mm-hmm. or you are not well yes. i can take it up so sometimes conflicts do happen did you guys go through something like this and if you did then how do you tackle this issue okay so fortunately we didn't had any conflict and our coaches told us this that there was like stockholm university regularly participates and the stockholm university professors the coaches they were so happy that this was the first time in which there was not even a minor issue so fortunately for us there was no conflict but i'll tell you why we didn't had any conflict there was a reason behind that so the team was more like it was three french one indian and one serbian and the student coach was from south korea okay so we all almost come from different parts of the world and the idea was all of us were accommodating that that was the key thing so let's say if somebody was not well in that particular thing so we need to help them out and we did it all of us did help each other so unless until you start accommodating and it's not like only the best friends make a good team it's more like the old school thinking that you know you should do this smooth with your best friend so that you get a free trip to this place okay so the idea is whoever is the best in your law school for that moot should represent the particular university in that moot it doesn't go like the french should go for it and the idea is like you you will be working in like two years or three years down the line you can't start saying that this guy or this girl is somebody whom with whom with whom i don't want to work right. it doesn't make any commercial sense to me in in moots and business like if you if you say this to anyone in the interview for any job even a petty job i don't think anyone is going to keep you in because that's the worst thing you can hear like i can't work with this person you need to start you know accommodating everyone and if you start just accommodating what you do you have team building activities so we had that we had like you know a get together we had an outing so there you get to know each other like what is their background where do they come from like my background is way different from my french friends because the french people in like france nobody speaks english nobody so if you speak english and if you have any law degree from france you will be employed and you get a very good salary because you speak english Fr- english is speaking french is like is more like a myth and whoever speaks will of course get a very good job so it's that le- so it's that background so you get to work with three french but they learned so much during the process and they were so good after the moot like if you talk to them and one of my friend has never spoken english in his entire life the only english learning for him was one year of erasmus and one year of stockholm so these are different you know cultures different things when you get to learn when you have you know an international team but even in india you have a lot of you know different cultures and traditions like people from south india is very different from north india I come from Bihar, but I was studying in Trichy in South India, which was a very different kind of experience for me. At least in the first six or one year, it six months or one year, it was a lot of time for me to actually accommodate to that particular thing. So, you need you need to start accommodating, and you can't just fight with your team and stop saying that you know this person I can't work with or that person. And if you have, if you can make your own team, it's a privilege. in some law schools you don't get a chance to make your own team it's based on the ranking if you get a chance please feel free to make your team with somebody who is good in moot and who is also in good terms with you but let's say if it it's not the way in your law school this works it's fine you shouldn't start complaining about it because it's the best of the best who goes for this moot which also makes sense to me right right 
so uh, akash now that you've talked about you know the entire strategy what did you guys follow i want to talk about uh, the award so you guys got a award for your best memorandum right now what were your strategy when you were drafting the arguments because i know for a fact that to figure out uh, from the moot proposition what can be the issue and what is your argument that itself is a huge task so how did you guys like what was your approach and you know tell us about the language which is followed in wis because i i am pretty sure the language differs from the international moots we are having in india and wis something of that uh, you know uh, level and uh, yeah i i just want to know the the entire idea behind drafting your memorial so i think the most important part is like your style of writing sentences so every i think all of the audience will be aware of this idac method which you use for your you know writing answers in the exam where you write issue research analysis and conclusion so the idac method if you start using it like it's a good method i'm not saying that law schools don't do it even in wis a lot of teams do it but especially the arbitrators who come from the western background and also some of the indian arbitrators i am also a part of that cohort which likes not irac but the creac method creac is fairly simple it's more like c r e a c which is more like conclusion research explanation application and conclusion the idea is that i'll give you a simple example so when you use the irac method what you say you say whether the claimant is liable to pay damages okay then you put the research right but the difference in creac is you start with an affirmative sentence you start with claimant is liable to pay damages which is more like an affirmation so which one of them is more convincing to you is that whether sentence more convincing to you which is more affirmative or do you think that claimant is liable to pay damages is more affirmative and the idea is whenever you start the sentence you put a short conclusion then followed by research explanation application and then in the last part again you rephrase the conclusion so that the readers know that okay so the again the conclusion is that claimant is liable to pay blah 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 so you have to showcase that this is my offer this is a very you know uh, crisp idea you have but it's not like in one paragraph you use creac another paragraph you are facing difficulty to frame creac sentence so you do irac then you do another method then creac no so the idea which we followed our coaches told us that it's all about clarity you follow whatever you want but you follow for the whole of the memo so every sentence in our memo was drafted with creac so always the first line was a conclusion and the last line was the conclusion so if you just read the first line you get a sense what is there in the paragraph so even if there is an very experienced arbitrator he doesn't have time because of his own commitments he just read the first line and he gets an image and the idea is that the reader should create an image in their in in, in their mind so if you are able to you know create an image in the reader's mind or during the orals in the judge's mind you are already there your job is done so we we follow this creac style but it's up to you like but i have seen a lot of teams which do not follow any pattern they just keep on writing long paragraphs and long paragraphs is always a bad idea keep it so simple that anyone can read it and a paragraph should not have like more than 4 5 or 6 lines it should be so crisp that creac one one line and then you package it that it this is one creac this is another creac and whenever you start you know writing the memo whenever you start an issue you have to draw a road map what are you going to do in that so you give an introduction and then you put one two three that this is what i am going to discuss and then you start, so your headings your you know your short headings your full headings should be so good that even if somebody reads your table of contents they get the idea what you have written in the whole memo so it's more about you know the crispness and the coherence in your memo that's it and it's not like you know some people start using uh, words in english which are not very familiar with the spoken english 
So what if there is a Japanese or Chinese arbitrator? I'm not saying like not all of them know English or don't know English, but it's it's tough for them because it's not their first language. Or even for that case, a French, because English is not something which they use in their daily life. They use it for business purposes. So what if a French or a Chinese person is going to evaluate your memo and you start writing words which are more in dictionary of Shashi Tharoor? So then you start having a problem because they they are not able to understand what you want to say. So keep it so simple and you know crisp so that everybody understands it. And please don't overdo you know the legal knowledge through the usage of legal maxims which you show off in Indian moots. Maybe it work in it can work in the Indian moots, but it doesn't work in the West moot. If you start using legal maxims which are so Indian or which are used in the Asian jurisdiction, if you start using it. it may have a negative effect of that so the idea is just keep it simple follow kriak irak whatever but throughout the memo it's not like you just start you know writing and keep on writing just like that and you do not have any style any paragraph so all the paragraphs should be of similar lengths it's not like you know one paragraph of 12 lines then you have another paragraph of four lines so it it shows that it's not coherent and you get marks for it otherwise like what do you think like what makes the difference everybody knows cisg arbitration everybody has fewer arbitration resource so it's always the same right so it it's all about how you present it the same applies for even the oral rounds everybody knows that particular case law which you have written in your memo everybody knows it everybody knows which actual principles are used here it's all about how you package it and you present it whether do you give respect to the arbitrators where you address them correctly so some people like coming back to the idea of having a coach if you don't know you start saying like you know your uh, honorable tribunal honorable judges you you can't say honorable judges in arbitration mode so that's where you need to either you see the youtube videos or you have somebody who tell you like how you address them so yeah right So Akash, we are we are done talking about memorials. Let's let's just talk about oral rounds now. Mm -hmm. So before uh, we actually go for you know the competition, mm -hmm. we have a habit of practicing. Some some people uh, you know uh, prefer practicing in front of a mirror. Some will actually casually you know get hold of a senior and they'll ask that yeah. can you listen to my argument or uh, if the faculty is okay. uh they will help you out so you know how many rounds of practice did you guys do like and who were your judges for these mocks i mean were your friends yeah. there were your the coaches there so what we did i i don't remember how many sessions but we had a lot of internal sessions internal sessions i mean the team so like when i was speaking like me and my friend was speaking then the other three were the arbitrators and we kept on doing this from feb 1 till the time we were in vienna like even during the rounds before the rounds or like the eve of the rounds we used to do that because we wanted to test how does it work whether this argument still works because it's not like one set of arguments which you keep on using it's more like you brush up every time and you change it right it, it's not like the fixed thing which you use in feb so what we were arguing in the bucharest first pre mode we weren't not using it in vienna we our whole um arguments were changed by that time because we kept on testing it so we had like let's say 10 styles we checked and there was one very good point of ours which is which was very strong point but it never worked in the pre meet so we decided to scrap that point because it was more like a rebel way to do it and nobody liked it so we knew that we are not going to do this in vienna so in orals like we had a lot of internal team hearings where you know two of us were speaking and the other three or four people were like actually judging us but apart from that that helps that helps a lot but the problem with that is it's a closed group it's more it's it's there exists a conflict in that let me put it this way because it's my friend my team members who are you know spending time with me for like 6 7 months they are going to judge me so some of them will be a bit biased or maybe not biased and the coaches are of course not biased they are experienced they are experienced people in arbitration but you need to keep on seeing new people so how do you meet new teams so you sign up for pre moots especially in west i think at least 50 or 60 pre moots are happening this time 
and everything is digitally it's free you just need to register for it even general global law school has a pre moot that's the only indian pre moot so you keep on registering for that especially during this digital time where you don't need to travel because when we were there i still remember we done, we, we were doing five pre moots and it was bucharest munich london helsinki and stockholm so you need to do a lot of practice within the team plus new faces new faces i mean somebody who doesn't know in your team who speaks better who doesn't speak better and you should take a call who should be the speaker or researcher once you have finished the pre moots then you know like which guy or which girl is more convincing but some teams have this you know thing that you know they pre decide things that in september itself i am the rank 1 so i should be the speaker and the rank 2 should be speaker and 3 4 5 are not so good people so they should be researcher that's that's not a very good way to do it that's more like you know the old school way of doing it so what you should do you should do this practice round and whenever you do the practice rounds with new people either in a pre moot or some people who works in arbitration field or some faculties who teach arbitration you give them a score sheet which is a dummy score sheet from bismuth it's always available on the internet and they give you marks and then you know and you keep a tally of that so whoever gets the most number of marks after the pre moots you decide with full consensus that the top two scorer should be the speaker that makes you know sense for you but some teams decide like they should go for four speakers two plus two but then you lose out on the best speakers award because for best best speaker you need to speak at least twice for one side so that's a lot of you know mathematics there but the idea is the best should be there so i i i think for the orals it's more about practice the internal practice pre moots and the new faces practice you need to meet new people who will give you inputs because sometimes you think that you are so good your english is um, on par when i say english it's not about the word it's about the number of words you speak so like i'm speaking right now is termed as not acceptable in this so like the indian way of speaking english is way too fast for the west mood so let's say if i have to go for the west i have to train like if i train somebody i have to train them that when you go to the west mood you have to say good morning members of the tribunal my name is akash gupta and together with blah 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 i represent so you need to be very slow and you need to pick up on the arbitrators it's not like if you have a chinese person sitting in the tribunal with a french person and the other one comes from japan you speak the same way then you have to slow down a lot you have to speak like good morning members of the tribunal you have to be so slow but let's say if you see people from you know uk us and australia good you don't need to lower down a lot of your pace so like the wisp moot actually publish who will be your arbitrators you get to know like one day before or two day before so you need to see like who is your tribunal because unless until you know like then what you do you start doing the indian way of you know speaking and then the problem is they do not even understand your points and if if some of them are a bit you know practical or you can term them as rude they may say stop could you please slow down for me and then it looks really bad so you have to make these decisions before you actually sign up for the oral rounds so that's something which you will learn either through a pre moot or somebody who tells you this or within the team's practice so that's why it's very important and you need to know like how you are going to speak whether you should be like and you need to have you know three kind of speeches ready the first one is like a 7 minutes because in which it's more like 15 plus 15 so if you are speaking you need to be ready with a 7 minutes argument 9 minutes argument and 13 minutes but most of the teams complain that oh i was speaking and then he cut me off at like 2 minutes and then i lost my mind i wasn't coming back to my road map and he, the arbitrator was speaking that's where you need to have a prepared 7 minutes argument so that even if the arbitrators speak a lot you have a lot of preparation so you come back to the 7 minutes argument and you finish so it's just the strongest points which you have to speak up not everything whatever you have written in the memo so that's why you need to prepare at least 3 or 4 styles of arguments so that if you get a judge who, who an arbitrator who doesn't ask you question so you go with the 13 14 minutes one 
if somebody who is asking you know some questions 11 but if somebody is asking a lot of questions they are cutting you off so it's 7 and there is one myth that some people think that you know arbitrators who ask a lot of questions are going to give you low marks that's not the case i also have an habit of asking questions but whoever even you know gives me a 60% of the answers which the questions i ask i always give them higher 90s so the people who ask you a question are some people who actually read the problem and they're trying to check like do you know this or do you know that if you are able to prove it you get a lot of marks but some of these students have an habit like after one or two questions they start making faces that they hate you because you ask questions so that's something which you have to you know learn throughout the mood you need to have a poker face if you have a smiling face keep smiling there is no problem but if you are smiling every time but whenever i ask you a question and you make faces like then of course like it it it's visible to everyone and so it shows that you are not very happy with the questions but if it's your mood you have worked for 8 months you should be happy with the questions because the more questions you answer the more points you get so yeah akash that that's a fabulous uh, you know um tip actually that uh, you should if you have a poker face have a poker face if you have a smiling face i think due to the intensity of the mood and the level of mood sometimes you know uh, the the participants are really anxious uh, yeah. so i think you made it very uh, seem like very easy so i just want to uh, you know ask you a couple of more question and i think mm-hmm. we can wrap up then so let's talk about the judges right you are talking that there were international judges from china japan and you know all over the world now uh, is there a, is there any specific trait which they look for uh, you know in a good speaker i mean that that's uh, w- what are the qualities which they look for basically and uh, you know since uh, we we our audience are indian law students is there anything which they should be mindful of yes that's a very good question actually because instead of like i i tell always my students that instead of writing what you think it's important in your cv you just you should start thinking from the employer's perspective what's important from their perspective because you have done a moot which is not relevant in that particular area but because it's very close to your heart because that's the best moot you have done you just write it and you start explaining the same moot in the sop so that's that's the logic when i come back to your question that i i'll put it this way the reality of arbitrators is this that let's divide the arbitrators in three categories the first category is people who are so enthusiastic about westmoot that they read the whole memo whichever they have evaluated your memo as well and the problem so they they know everything because they are working in arbitration field and they are going to ask you questions the second category is the average one who you know actually reads everything during the travel time and the third one is they haven't read the problem so the problem for these students is not the first or the second one the problem is with the third one but students think that all of the arbitrators whoever is asking a question either has read it or is so good but there may be a chance that the arbitrator is genuinely he wants you to explore that and guide them but what you think no no he's trying to make fun of me so the problem is you need to prepare for this third category of arbitrators and you need to actually help them to understand what the problem is so the idea is that the first second will of course get what you are saying the cases what you are saying the facts which you are putting but the third one doesn't know so they ask some you know random question so that's the thing which you need to prepare for if you actually you know uh, satisfy the ego of that particular arbitrator that's everything because you have to answer those questions because the other questions are already the frequently asked questions which you have already prepared during the phase of preparation so the idea is that the arbitrators look for only one thing whoever is who, who, who whoever has a confident and whoever makes commercial sense that's it if you make commercial sense in a mood because when we go for mood it's like it looks very unreal so arbitrators are not unreal because they are the ones who practice that or they teach that particular subject so what they look for whether what you say makes commercial sense in reality and there is a commercial sense principle as well from uk which is a lot of times quoted in westmood that 
there should be a commercial sense of an interpretation of the contract if it doesn't make commercial sense it, it, it it's not the best way of interpreting it so if you can show them that your client is the good guys and it, it doesn't matter whether you have done something wrong or not whether you have paid or you have not paid but if you can showcase that you know this interpretation we accept that there exists another interpretation which doesn't help our client we accept it stop arguing in a way that this is the only way of our you know arguing because some teams do this that they portray that this is our argument and this is a interpretation and they don't say that there is a b interpretation which is exactly opposite of it so the better way is that you go to the tribunal and you say members of the tribunal there are two interpretations to this problem first which gives power to this tribunal second that there is no power to this tribunal then you explain the two one and then they look for why we should go for your preferred interpretation if you if you answer this that's the end of the world because the other team will of course argue so please do not argue in you know uh, in ignorance of the other interpretation or the other team's interpretation and there is one more thing which arbitrators look for especially when you are the responding party so let's say the proceedings start because it's a jurisdiction issue with the respondent and you are the claimant so you respond to the jurisdiction issue so the person who is actually arguing from the claimant side which is speaking second does not respond to the arguments made by the respondent which doesn't make sense the arbitrators always look for a response because otherwise it seems like it's an unreal thing like imagine in a court of law do you think somebody who's responding will not respond to the arguments they'll just argue in front of the tribunal or court no they'll respond to whatever the arguments has been made so they keep on saying that the respondent argued this however there exists another set of interpretation which i'll be elaborating 1 2 3 4 and whenever you argue you do not argue like you know you read out your whole script or you read out your memorandum it's more about you just say i have two points to make first blah 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 second blah 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 moving on with my first point i have two submissions to make one blah 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 two blah 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 starting with my first submission then you explain it so that the judges know exactly that this is your road map you you are going to argue for two issues in those two issues you have ab ab that's it otherwise if you start arguing that i am going to argue for jurisdiction and my co counsel will be arguing for contractual issues and i i and and let me quote a case law for you to make your job hard so what you need to do is make the arbitrator's job easier right so how you make the arbitrator's job easier even if they haven't read anything when you start giving an introduction you know you give one or two line introduction which is more like the respondent has agreed to resolve any disputes but when the time came to enforce this promise the arbitration agreement now they are challenging the jurisdiction of this tribunal that's the introduction after that you say that i will be dealing with i have two submissions to make one to the issues name and my co counsel will be dealing with three four whatever it is then you start moving on with my first blah 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 so then they know that this is the introduction so you you don't actually argue in the first phase you just give an introduction and you say that we are the good guys see we promised to go for arbitration agreement but look at this party they are saying that we shouldn't go for arbitration they are challenging jurisdiction so it's a very simple there is nothing like a legal thing in that introduction then you have a road map and please make sure that whenever you finish it doesn't matter even if you finish before time or after time whenever they ask you to wrap up what you do you just put one line conclusion you just say because the claimant has signed up for the arbitration agreement this arbitration this arbitral tribunal shall have the jurisdiction arising out of the arbitration agreement signed in between the parties boo so the last image in front of the arbitrators is that this guy is you know if you have seen this you know this comedy shows like you know uh, this canvas laugh club or all these comedy shows so they start with a joke every time if you have seen this anubhav bassi's the hostel thing in which he was uh, uh, they they actually uh, dropped the water tanker or something so he actually started with that joke and he ended the same with a very connected joke to the water tanker so it's more like where you start from you have to you know the climax is important so when you conclude it 
with that introduction when it is related to the introduction it's more like a package so if it's a good package you get good marks it's more about a package it's all about how you present it because at the end everybody works for 8 months everybody knows what laws are applicable what are the cases what are the leading cases on that everybody knows that everyone so that's the only thing which makes the difference right so akash i think you know we have uh, heard so many good things uh, about ways from you just by last question and and i just saw the time you know uh, if we have overshot by 17 minutes and i'm pretty sure that there are a lot of key takeaways from the session so i just want to ask you one last question let's mm-hmm. say you know anyone anyone uh, enrolled in any law school wants to go for a mood like this right it's the dream mode for a lot of people what is that one advice uh, you want to give uh, since you have already done the mode thrice what's just one piece of advice which you want to share with the audience okay so because in the wis mode to qualify for the knockouts your memo marks are not taken into consideration it's just your orals so i just have one line advice for the orals that is always finish within time everybody loves people who finish within time and at least you get two or three four marks bonus if you finish within time especially when the arbitrators ask you a lot of question never overgo your time limit and whenever you have 40 seconds left out of the 15 minutes allotted please be very respectful and say that members of the tribunal i see my time is running out i seek an extension for 30 seconds never ask for four minutes five minutes i see some indian teams asking for two minutes always ask for maximum 30 seconds in case if the arbitrators are very kind enough they are going to give you one minute but just ask for 30 seconds wrap up and done don't overgo your time even if you are so bad at arguing you are not going to get more marks by arguing over time that's the harsh reality so always finish within time and ask for time but please like somebody misquoted this i still remember i was talking in a law school and somebody asked me this question that what if a judge is asking me questions should i ask for an extension if somebody is asking you question it is understood that you will be over time if somebody asks you question at 14 45 don't ask for the time before the answer you answer it then you ask that i seek an extension of 30 seconds to wrap up my submission don't don't do like you know oh you asked me a question can you give me some time that's a very rude way to do it yeah right <clears throat> yeah so thank you akash for sharing this and i'm pretty sure uh, you know we've covered all aspects of this do's and don'ts uh, how should you go about it what should be your uh, research what should be your strategy i'm pretty sure if now anyone wants to go forward with this uh, moot they they can always you know see this video and uh, they will know the insider story from a person who has been there done that right and as you mentioned that we fear uh, you know reaching out to people for help and uh, you, you know now that you have told them that don't worry you can reach out to people for help i'm pretty sure uh, anyone of our audience if they go ahead with the wish mood they are going to reach out to you and uh, yeah mm-hmm. this this video is really really helpful and uh, you know thanks for doing the session i just want to take this opportunity and you know want to thank you for taking out time and i'm pretty sure this moot in itself is a huge thing and you giving us the insights is you know like uh, is of tremendous help so thank you again for uh, you know joining us and uh, i so would much. like to host you again in the future maybe on a different topic maybe arbitration you never know